please welcome research director Skift, Luke Bujarski. Hello. Hi. So here we go, another Skifter talking about the future of travel, right? Um, so uh, six months ago, Rafat challenged us. He said, we need to capture the voice of the travel consumer and ultimately report that back to the industry. Um, six months, uh, tons of surveys, focus groups, interviews later, and here we go. We have uh, what we call the Traveler's Manifesto, and ultimately this was an exercise in understanding what the super traveler ultimately wants from the industry. Why super traveler? Because these are ultimately the people that have a voice, that have an opinion about the, uh, the products and services that we provide to travel in general. And here's the plug. Thanks, Fathom, for making all this, this amazing project possible. Hopefully, you, you have the uh, magazine in your hands already. You've had a chance to read some of the, some of the great content that we've, we've produced in there. Ultimately, to, to kind of distill all of the, the craziness that's happening in the industry these days and you know, along the axis of marketing, tech, uh, design, um, so how did we respond to, to, to Rafat's challenge in terms of capturing the, the, the voice of the super traveler? We're going to have some, some actual super travelers come out here on stage to, to talk about what they, what they think we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. But I wanted to, to, to walk you through a little bit of our own journey in understanding these, uh, these people uh, and, and what they want. So we started with what we know best in terms of, uh, and ultimately that's... Uh, uh, the, uh, the latest and greatest in what the travel industry is doing, right? So one thing that we, we, we clearly noticed is that there's this huge focus at the point of travel now, right? We're talking about in-destination tech. We're talking about the, uh, the recent acquisition spree across, uh, ac across mapping. We're talking about all the attention that companies like TripAdvisor are getting these days, user-generated content, everything that's involved when it comes to uh, understanding the full traveler journey. So, we, so we're talking about the future of travel. We know that it's all about in destination. Why? I think at this point, it's pretty much a no-brainer. 2007, uh, iPhone comes out, and it doesn't really take long for a lot of these different components to really start falling into place, right? Messaging, uh, web, mobile. Mapping, social media going mobile, now user-generated user content, now even relationships are going on uh, on mobile. So all these different uh, touch points that we ultimately interact with as travelers are also kind of double-edged swords for the travel industry because great, we have all these new touch points that we can interact with, but at the same time, it's kind of a clusterfuck, right, in terms of all these different uh, uh, channels that we have to interact with, uh, just all the, 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 the lack of uh, focus in terms of where we allocate our marketing and branding dollars. So, okay, so we know that it's in destination, we know that it's all about, uh, we know that it's all about mobile tech, what about the human element? Here we're, we're hearing buzzwords like experiential, authentic, living like a local, personalization, all, these, all of these kind of humanistic components that so many of our marketing, marketing, uh, marketing dollars are going to these days. Just to kind of put things into perspective in terms of the, the experiential traveler, right? Um, this was, uh, I took this picture about a month ago during a, uh, a weekend getaway to Chicago. We ended up going with the Airbnb for really just for one reason, because we, I wanted to go back to Wicker Park. I don't know if for those of you that are familiar with Chicago, Wicker Park's really the, uh, the key kind of trendy neighborhood these days. It has been for a long time, but we went with the Airbnb option and we ended up staying with Marissa, right? So Marissa runs her business out of her apartment, her rental business out of her apartment, but also runs a vintage furniture and decor store out of that apartment. So everything in her apartment is actually for sale with little sticker prices on them. So you can go through and, 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 and kind of beautiful apartment, two bedroom apartment, 
heart of Wicker Park, uh, parking spot and back, 150 bucks a night, and this really cool experience. Point here is that in just a couple of hours, I felt like I was back in, living in Chicago. It was a really unique experience that it, it's really hard to duplicate, right? This is what people are getting excited about these days. Great, so we know that it's all about in destination. We know that it's all about mobile tech. We know that it's all about personalization, these three pillars. We really needed a framework to understand the traveler mindset, so, uh, so here we are, the funnel, right? The, the classic funnel that have, we've been using if, for years, if not decades, um, which is great in terms, of, in terms of getting us through that door, but once we get that customer past the door, what do we, how, are we, how are we gonna understand that traveler mindset. We decided to step outside of the travel ecosystem and the business world in general to kind of understand to, and, and look a little bit further in time to, uh, to understand what it all means. And we came across this guy, Joseph Campbell, uh, just like uh, Eli yesterday so eloquently talked about, echoed about the kind of the implications of his various theories and. Uh, as a philosopher, as, a, as an expert uh, in ancient mythology, he, Campbell really understood uh, one thing, that ultimately our modern day belief system, the, the way that we interact with each other is very much based on this travel instinct that was created through the stories that we've told over the thousands of years of people uh, entering into new worlds, exploring, and then bringing those stories back inspiring others to keep, keep that cycle going, right? Over time, it's that travel instinct that, that was built into our, into our psyche. So, so he really did us, did us a favor in that sense because he, he looked at it not only from this kind of perspective as a purchaser, but also from an emotional perspective, right? An emotional journey kind of stepping in, a, in and out of this ordinary world into this special world that we call travel and back into this ordinary world. It's something that we, it's a cycle that we all go through almost, almost as something, as, a, as an opportunity for us to grow, to understand, what, understand where we're coming from. It's almost a necessity, we feel like, these days. And, and, and some, there's some really interesting implications that uh, this model provides us now in the context of the travel industry. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, with this guy? Griswold, right? So if I were to run a uh, mar uh, travel marketing 101 class, I would have my students read Campbell's Hero of a Thousand Faces and then watch this movie to really understand where we've been and where we are. Um, two things here. Clearly there's the behavior aspect, right? Uh, all of the, the craziness, all of the the shit that Clark and his family went through to get to Wally World to finally succeed in their mission, in their journey, in his journey, ultimately, to show his family good time, uh, really would probably would never happen these days, right, with the technology components that we, ca we travel with, with our mobile phones. We would never run into some of these issues. Um, but also, we wouldn't have that, that emotional experience either. So it's, a two, it's, a, it's, it's, it's really two things. It's behavior and it's the experience that are completely different from just, I mean, maybe, what, what is this, the 80s, 85, I'm guessing? But still, I mean, really not that much time in the, in the greater scheme of things. Long story short, I think that the big lesson with, uh, with the whole journey aspect and, and thinking, about, thinking outside of the travel and business ecosystem here is that even though we're all different, we're all unique in terms of what we want to experience, there's this commonality, this, this emotional journey that a lot of travel experiences tend to share. There are ups and downs where these, these, emotion, these emotional journeys take the wrong turns. These, these are the elements that we're really starting to understand. Um, so, so we wanted to put a little bit of theory here behind it, take that theory and put a little bit of analysis behind it. So we launched our 2016 
in Destination Traveler Behavior Survey. We, and these are just a couple of highlights, some, uh, some things that we noticed uh, along the traveler journey. We actually surveyed people that were traveling at the time of the survey, so really fresh in their mind in terms of what apps they were using, their preferences in terms of uh, platforms, et cetera. One thing we found out that travelers are more connected than non-travelers, at least they perceive themselves as more connected, right? 60% stated that they, uh, they, they, they're accessing their mobile phones more often when, they're, when they were traveling than they do back home. There's this thirst for maps, right? Entering into the unknown. 70% uh, said that maps were extremely, so mapping apps, not the paper maps that we find in our glove compartments, uh, are extremely important in helping us navigate uh, while we're in destination. Social media usage goes way up when we're traveling. 63% again said that they use social media more often. And we know that travel pics will end up on social media as people travel. 70% said they were very likely to post regular updates and pictures of their trip on social media. This is one of my favorites. Uh, really interesting thing we noticed was that trip satisfaction, right, actually tops out at the beginning, tends to top out at the beginning of a trip. Uh, we asked them in terms of how satisfied they were, and we, we noticed that those at the beginning of their trip were more likely to be satisfied than people that were towards the end of their trip. And that kind of makes sense, right? You get the bill from the hotel, hotel bar, or, uh, you know, uh, Something goes wrong, you get sick, you get food poisoning, but it's those pitfalls that we have to watch out for and those emotional ups and downs that we really need to pay attention to since we're focusing on those big three pillars, right? We're looking at uh, in-destination, mobile tech, personalized travel. It's an opportunity to really, uh, really put some numbers behind that emotional aspect of travel. And obviously we're not there yet in terms of the tech, but thinking what it's all gonna look like 10 years from now in terms of uh, what's happening with voice and unstructured, uh, unstructured search, um, health bands, for example, and measuring overall health and stress and how we can ultimately interact with across all these different channels. So I'm just gonna leave you with this. Uh, this was part of another survey that we did. It's our digital, transfer digital transformation and travel survey that we're, that's actually still in the field, but these are some pre preliminary results uh, looking at asking our, uh, our SCIFT audience about what their digital transformation needs are, the, the things that they're looking at in terms of automation, uh, marketing, personalization, tech, and what, we, what, we, what we're seeing is that people are very concerned when it comes to having the right amount of budget and talent to compete in the digital world. So when we think about the broader space and how, how complex it is to actually connect with the consumer on those three pillars, right? In destination, mobile tech, and personalization, we can start to draw some conclusions about where the industry might be going. And I'll leave that up to you guys to, to, to debate over, um, but uh, but that's, 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 the, uh, that's kind of the, the final word that I wanted to tell, share with you guys. So thank you very much. All right, and you don't have to, you don't actually have to believe me. We're gonna bring out some, some super travelers right now uh, and we can hear, hear, hear about all their experiences and what they actually want from the travel industry. Joining Luke, please welcome entrepreneur and venture capitalist Leonard Brody. Head of Communications Strategy, Fred and Fareed, Colin Nagy. Founding partner, Future Perfect Ventures, Jalik Jobanputra. And COO, Wearable Experiments, Alexandra Wood, Colin. for our Super Travelers panel, brought to you by Ali hey, Alex. How you doing?
All right, so these are the guys that you want to be uh, listening to when it comes to pretty much everything that you do in terms of connecting with the, with the, with the consumer, uh, with the travel consumer. Uh, let's hear a little bit about them. Let's hear about what makes them super travelers, right? The people that actually give a rat's ass about travel and uh, having that active voice rather than the passive voice, those people that only travel once or twice a year, these people do a little bit more travel than that. So let's start with you, Alex. Hi, uh, hi everyone. So I, um, I end up traveling quite a bit for work. Um, I used to work for a big advertising and media company and I have to travel across six different continents. So travel's become kind of, kind of like sport for me. Okay. Sure. Hi, I'm Jalik Jobin Putra. I run an early stage venture capital fund here in New York. Um, have spent my career first in investment banking and then venture capital over the last 20 years, traveling an extensive amount um, for work, but also do a lot of personal travel. Traveled around the world several times by myself, so very much an adventure traveler on, um, on my personal time. I'm Colin Nagy. I work for a creative agency called Fred Fareed. Uh, we're in Paris, New York, and Shanghai. And uh, I just spend a lot of time on the road, a lot of back and forth to the Middle East, Asia, Europe. And uh, I also write a column in Skift uh, on kind of customer experience and kind of how travel brands should be thinking about how they talk and interact and communicate with people like us, I suppose. My name is Leonard. I'm an entrepreneur. I've built about four or five companies over the last decade, roughly, mostly in the digital crosshairs between sport, media, and entertainment. I've known Rafa a very long time. And I travel, I do, on average, in the last six years, I've done between 500 and 600,000 miles in the air per year. So I'm uh, stuck in a tube most of my life. OK. So what is that? Is that out of necessity? Is it out of love? Is it out of pain? Is it, why do you do yeah. that to yourself? <laughs> I just forgot what houses look like, and I just thought that's where you went. Um, no, it's necessity. It's, it's purely for work. So I live between three cities, uh, between London, Vancouver, and Los Angeles. And then most of my work takes me to Europe pretty regularly and to Asia, and then up and down between sort of the, the worst flights are actually the cross North America flights are the most difficult from a timing perspective. But it's mostly necessity. It's all work. I actually don't like traveling for leisure. I prefer to stay home whenever possible because I'm on a plane all the time. So I actually do right. very little leisure travel in almost all business. OK, so out of necessity then, what's one thing that you would change in, in terms of the overall experience, if you could? You, you know, there's so many facets to the, to the journey through travel, whether you're talking about airline or hotel. But, but for me, one of the major touch points that is uh, annoying particularly in airlines, is actually noise pollution. So the airlines are horrible at consistently talking all the time over top. So whether it's, you know, you have to do your PSAs and all that stuff, but just the amount of, that when, you're tra when you're traveling in business and you are on a flight, a good chunk of the people on that plane are doing calls up until the second they're leaving, and they're battling against people consistently talking over them, over the airway. So it's, for me, it sounds ridiculous, but one of the big challenges I have on the flight side of it is just the noise pollution is immense. Right, that makes sense. Makes sense. Colin, what about you? My personal favorite is when I can't sleep because flight attendants are bitching in front of me on the plane, <laughs> which happens a lot. Um, but I think the big thing for me is uh, it's not necessarily related to the actual onboard product. It's just I spend so much time sitting in traffic trying to get to Kennedy. So I look at cities like Hong Kong and Zurich, you know, Stockholm, places, even, you know, London Heathrow Express, like places where it's very easy for like a business traveler or a leisure traveler to like get to the airport quickly. Um, I'm just aghast at the state of like infrastructure it here. Um, and, and that's like the biggest friction point because it's in aggregate, it adds up to like a lot of time. And okay, so, uh, so some of those things, we can't, sometimes we can't really control the airlines or the hotels. It's, it's not something, some of those aspects are completely out of our control. Is there anything that um, those brands can do to, to help, help you across that, take, making those steps? I think what you're finding is that when you're actually arriving at the airport, um, airline brands that are, that are making the check-in process a lot smoother and kind of remove it, like once you get through like the hell that is getting to the airport, like they're doing a good job at kind of like expediting people through. That combined with, you know, pre-check actually 
makes that friction point solved nicely. So that's one thing they can control. Yeah, I mean, I, just on, on that point with um, Delta One in LA, I, I find you know fantastic because they have their own entrance, um, you know, and, and they check you in. I mean, I, I actually um, was just there, and, and I had something that was too much liquid, and I had to come back through security. They found a box for me, they packed it up, and I could just go. And so it's that kind of service for frequent travelers that you know, I, I think is really valuable. Um, Alec? Yeah. I think for me, a big pain point has honestly been around the complexity with um, rewards programs. So because I travel so much, I've accrued all these miles and different like levels of status, which is really great. But then when I go to try to redeem these rewards or understand what they would get me, I, I'm kind of floored. I don't know what, um, what, what I'm getting for all of these points. So I think if there's a bit more simplicity around that, um, that aspect, it'll remove kind of overall friction from right. I mean, I got a flyer talk <laughs> when I'm about totally. when I want to redeem miles. And, and I mean, that's not the most efficient way to, you know, search for, you know, what, what's the best way. And I, I also find, you know, as much as I like Delta for certain things, I mean, I'm a Delta frequent flyer, um, the redemption, you know, it's 50,000 miles now uh, to redeem to go to the West Coast. And, you know, it, it's, you, it, it's just so much more difficult and, and, and a lot more to, to redeem these miles. So we're accumulating all these miles, but using them, and I do do a lot of leisure travel, or use, using them is, is, is challenging. The, the, issue, the issue, honestly, like whether it's hospitality or whether it's air, the issue is on boarding. And the airlines and the hotels have traditionally done terrible jobs. So at, at Anschutz, where I was uh, chief digital officer for a long time, we owned a lot of hotels. And we spent a lot of time talking about, with the, the flags that, that ran the buildings for us, about the onboarding experience. And it was so poorly thought out and is still relatively poorly thought out. Because that, that friction, forget about tech forget about technology, but just the ability to have a simple email or phone relationship with somebody a day, two days before they're arriving so that that room experience is much easier when they, when they cross that threshold. Onboarding is very poorly executed by hotels typically and even worse by airlines. Although the one airline I would encourage you to, to look at, and I'm not just saying this because I'm Canadian, but if you look at Air Canada, I have flown pretty much every flag carrier that you can fly on and there is very rarely an airline that has got their, their frequent traveler experience down as well as Air Canada has done. I mean, right down to having a concierge system for their higher travelers. So when my flight is late, I get a phone call from the concierge well before TripIt uh, Trip or any of the notifications come in. They're well on top of it. They're there greeting you at the plane. It's a really, really, as good as you can make it, Air Canada has done an incredible job of making that very seamless. You know, one of the one of the uh, ten maxims that we came up with uh, for the super travel is, traveler is that super travelers want real rewards, and that uh, gimmicks will only breed discontent and disloyalty. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I think there's a certain element of personalization, not maybe hyper personalization, but just an understanding of what I value, and then if you if you give me a reward that's in line with what I value. That's a win, but then if you're then just kind of throwing a reward at me that has nothing to do with me, that's then a distraction. I get infuriated, and that totally backfires. I keep getting um, drink vouchers on Delta. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they if they if they knew me as a, as a consumer, they know right. that you know I, rare, I I usually don't drink on flights, right. and I'd rather have something that's that's more valuable, um, especially as a frequent flyer. Um, I mean, I invest in machine learning and, and blockchain and you know, data technologies for a living, so um, it's frustrating to see how far behind the travel industry is, um, even more far behind than, you know, say, the financial services industry, which is pretty far behind, in, in terms of personalization and using data and interoperability. Um, I mean, I think I was talking to someone backstage about how you know, a lot of the, the um, industry is on mainframes. And, um, you know, when we're getting used to personalization um, in every other aspect of our life and, and um, travel, which is such an, you know, for a lot of us, a very essential part of our lives, when we can't have that same personalization, it's pretty frustrating. Right, I think Colin has a lot to, <laughs> a lot to say about Well, I think a lot of, I mean, just in terms of rewards, 
a lot of it is Lucy with the football, right? It's like, it's very confusing. Like, you're just like, oh, I have this awesome thing. Whoops, no, there's an exception. And I think that that's, that ends up being uh, a bit of a pain. But I think to your point, um, sometimes it's the interplay between very simple data, a little bit of tech, and then placing that in the hands of like a capable human who's like the last, the last kind of meter. Cool. And, and I think that that is where, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel and like big data and all of this stuff, like that's great, but sometimes it's like just knowing that I'm arriving earlier than I typically do and, and then having some sort of like intuition, like that's the type of magic that I think if we see that at scale and we see that replicated with like bigger chains, I think that that's kind of what people want as opposed to like here's a coupon for like a drink that you're not going to drink, like bad Chardonnay in a lounge. So. You know. I, I, would, I would give you a total contrarian view. I actually don't care about rewards at all. It's meaningless to me. Well, to me, you, you don't travel for, for leisure. Either, well, but, right? but even, so. if, uh, even if I did, my points, whatever I have, I, I usually i will donate them, I'll give them away, I'll give them to friends and family, I'll give them all to you if you want. But the, 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 rea the reality is, to me, for a super traveler, for somebody who's traveling three, 400,000 miles, giving them points is like giving a guy who just won a hot dog eating contest a free bunch of hot dogs. It's like, it's not that, it's not that helpful. I don't, you know, I don't want to see a plane. I don't, like, so for me, the reward is get the experience right. Make, make my journey and my time easier. Make it a great experience. That should be the reward. I don't want the payoff after. I want the payoff during the experience. And that's where less time is spent focused. And so do, do I care? Uh, I, I mean, it's nice to get the points, and it's nice to be able to have currency to do stuff with. But I would much rather reverse engineer that currency into something that's valuable on the day of, on game day, when it really matters. And you're clients are yelling at you and your kids are yelling at you and you're trying to get stuff done and you're, you're, you're sad because you're away from home. Like those, are, those are the real touch points, moments that they have to get right. And, and points just don't, and rewards don't get at that. It's, it's not a, it, to me it's, a, in, it's an inefficient and inappropriate payoff. So, I mean, I think this is an example of personalization, though, because I still think, you know, I think there's some people who would care about rewards sure. and, and, but knowing you know, what's important to some of your best customers is, is what really matters. And, you know, you can't just generalize, um, you know, that drink vouchers matter to everyone or no rewards mm -hmm. matter to everyone. I, I think it's just figuring out, you know, who that customer is. Right. And that goes back to onboarding. It, it really, like, it, to me, it is, it is all about really understanding the moment you leave your home, the week before, what the, and, and we're at a stage now both technologically and from a customer service perspective, where any hospitality industry should be able to do that and do it pretty effectively. Yeah. Right. What I find really interesting is, uh, in in cases where there's like such a there's a focus on rewards, oftentimes it's just so that I get a decent experience, so that an airline or a hotel treats me like a human being. So I, I'm going to get to diamond medallion because then maybe someone will be nice to me. So if... Well, sometimes. Right, sometimes. <laughs> right. So in cases where that experience is already there, and so there's a, there's a travel brand that I really love, a hotel that I stay at, that has no rewards program whatsoever, but I'd stay there nine times out of ten because the experience is one that um, is personalized to me or like my, my demographic, um, and like it, it feels great to stay there. Right. So in terms of loyalty points, then loyalty programs very much a double-edged sword. It seems like, right? So loyalty for the sake of loyalty is uh, is a uh, it could be a, could, could be a dangerous thing. And it's also something else to keep track of, right? So it, it's and, and they kind of hope that you forget about it. <laughs> okay. So it's not useful. Okay. So so what about once you get there, right? With the accommodations, there's so much. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion in terms of how we, uh, how we market to people these days. Is it authenticity? Is it um, you know, blending all these different concepts? Do you think that accommodation providers specifically, and I'm directing this question to Colin because we were talking about it backstage, but do you think that they do a good job in connecting with you? It just depends. I mean, some of the ones that you like log enough time with, uh, they you know, the two that stand out to me, are like the Park Hyatt in Tokyo and the Upper House in Hong Kong are, are two hotels that like every single interaction with them is like pitch perfect. 
And, and it's like, I, I wish that in other instances and other kind of experiences, like that was more of a standard, but they're definitely like the exception rather than the rule. Um, but yeah, I think that a lot of people, what I'm finding is everyone's trying to do backflips with data and like digital experiences and like sometimes that can be useful, but it, it really is, it really is just kind of like the core of executing like hospitality very well and recognizing someone when they come back in and getting like the small things right, especially within like 20 minutes of like check-in, which I always kind of joke about and like it's a common thing in the industry. It's like if you get everything right with to your point that onboarding or, ch or, or checking in and removing friction from that process, like you're willing to overlook other things. Yeah. But if that's a nightmare, like every scuff on the wall is like 10 times bigger and like every third phone ring that goes unanswered, I'm like, you know, so, so there's, there's just blocking and tackling, especially with like the good hotels that if they, they get that right, they don't need to have some vast data profile on me and they don't need to like, you know, chase me around the internet. They just, it's like execution and some recognition. Right, I mean, the worst is just waiting, getting off a long flight and then waiting to check in. Totally. <laughs> I mean, that's something that can be taken care of pretty, pretty easily. Um, I mean, I remember staying at the mas mansion on Turtle Creek. Um, I was doing, when I was a banker, I was doing a deal there in the mid-90s, and uh, every time I returned, they, they knew exactly, almost exactly when I was getting, and, and this was pre-smartphone and pre-cell phone, but they kind of knew when I was going to get there based on previous patterns of when I would fly in from New York. And um, after a while, they had um, you know, my favorite meal waiting for me, uh, whether I would requested it or not. Um, and I mean, that was so long ago, and I feel like because of profit pressures and you know, chains taking over, I mean, that, even that little bit has, has gone away, and we actually do have the more data tools to, you know, even if it's a, a couple notes, right, that someone makes in the system about you know, what your preferences are. So, um, I mean, I, I rarely encounter that level of service any, anywhere in the world. I mean, Park Hyatt is one, and uh, St. Regis in Mumbai is, is, is pretty good about that. Yeah, we've heard that, we've heard that throughout the last couple of days, execution, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's humans wanting, like humans right. desiring Service. to go for like an A on the paper. Right. You know what I mean? Which, which it's actually that, that subtle desire. And I think we, I love reading how Danny Meyer runs his businesses because so much of it is like the type of people you hire and the mindset of the people you hire. So it's like that's the, that's the missing alchemy that can't be replicated by like big data or like, you know, some fancy app. But, but there, is a, there is an important, I've heard a lot of the hoteliers talk about their teams and how important they are and the staff. And, and th there is a very fine line between being friendly and welcoming and being genuine. And, and that is a very rare breed. It's very rare, I find, to walk into a luxury hotel or a business hotel where the staff are just genuinely at ease, real people, friendly and cool. It's often a facade, it's often the fake smile, it's just not, it's not a good vibe. And, and, and honestly, there are many of these hotels that overtrain, and they take away the authenticity of their staff and the genuineness, and the best, I'm sounding very Canadian, but the, I, I, the best experience that I have ever had in my life from a travel perspective is the Fogo Island Inn in Fogo Island. And if you ever have an opportunity to go there, you should go because it is one of the most incredible hospitality experiences you will ever have in your life. From, from the design of the keys to the second you walk off the boat to, and just very genuine, very authentic, very personalized. I mean, Zita Cobb, who runs the resort, basically saved this little fishing island by, by building this resort on it in this very modernist, beautiful resort. And she should not be running a hotel. She should be running a hotel school because it, it's way better than any of the luxury hotels I've ever stayed at. Incredible experience. Alex? I think what, what often gets overlooked, and this is not just the travel industry, it's kind of any big legacy industry, is actually the tools that you give employees to do their jobs effectively. So there might be a big focus on uh, how, how great the experience is in the airline app, but then you go up to the, to the counter and you realize this poor airline employee has to go through 50 screens to figure out who you are, where you're flying. I think, and, and that causes frustration on their end, and then you, you then feel the, the effect of that. So I think there also has to be some work done, um, kind of to the points made earlier, to kind of power these, empower these um, 
hospitality employees with the tools and the data that they need to then deliver that exceptional customer experience. Do you blame the, do you blame the employee or do you blame the brand? I blame the brand. I mean, yeah, I mean the like, employee. Right. I, I'm can, always right? changing my flights, and um, you know I don't usually go for the the most expensive. So um, I always I have to wait, you know, another five ten minutes to see if they can refund my change fee, and they almost always do. But it's still that process of you know maybe talking to one or two supervisors, yeah. and and if that employee could you know pull up, okay, well, you know, I mean, or knows that I'm one of their frequent travelers and. And, and they make this exception almost every single time, but it still wastes some time on the phone to do it. Um, well, for an industry that's obsessed with efficiency, right, where it's like the, the joke about taking the olive out of the salad saved someone like millions and millions of dollars. Like, and again, this is utopian because I know Sabre and what's required of it and everything, but like, if you take the time wasted on someone clattering away at a keyboard, and you're like, right. what are they doing? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's like, all the <laughs> are they solving cold fusion, or are they moving me yeah. to an aisle seat? And God, and God um, forbid, God forbid. And, and again, this is utopian, because I know that they have to use it, but, but it's like, if you, if you could consolidate that into like 30 yeah. seconds, um, there's some efficiency for you, yeah. so. Right. right. So Leonard, what's, what brand gets you? I, I'm very curious, where do you stay when you travel, because you're, is it different places every time, or do you have your go-to brands? Um, I, I usually stay at the same places. So if I'm in London, I stay at the same place, and I'm usually at the same place in, in L.A. Um, the, and they're usually either independent or small chains. So f for, for me, from a philosophical perspective, I'm very committed to the Dorchester group of hotels. I stay wherever they have a property, I'll stay, just because they're very good at... Uh, I find they're better at onboarding than most. Still not the best, as every you know, as everybody has to strive to be better. But but I usually stay there. But uh, I do. I am a bit of a, uh, a hotel whore. I will go to the new hotel when it opens because I want to check it out and I'm interested and in look and feel. But I usually rarely will go back in, unless it's significantly and demonstrably better. But I usually have those go tos and I'll stay. And and it's it used to be. I, I won't name the the chain of them, but there was a one of the large luxury chains that I used to stay at in every city, and I would give them 200 room nights personally, let alone with my company a year. Mm -hmm. And we had this ridiculous conversation over and over again where they would say, they didn't have a loyalty program, and I didn't care, but I was just curious why, and they said, because our loyalty program works in the background. I'm like, it works in the background? What does that even mean? And, the, and then they were telling you, because we know everything about you, but then they would never know, like you would show up at a hotel in Seoul and they would never know who you were, and I'd just given up on it, it was enough, and I figured you weren't getting the benefit. So for me, it's just about consistency. Right. Colin? I think um, of the hotels that I think are great, or the chains I think are great, um, you know, it's not a chain, but I mentioned Upper House, which is fantastic, and they have a few other hotels, Opposite House and Waterhouse. Um, it's owned by Swire. And then I really think that the Peninsula is a very elegant chain that always like delivers pretty well for me. I think that the old, the old Mandarin in Hong Kong is a favorite. Um, and then for a general brand, I would say I do like Park Hyatt a lot. Um, I used to stay at the, the St. Regis, but I kind of found them slipping a lot. Um, and I'm trying to think, and I agree, sometimes I'll just find, go on tablet or like via word of mouth and find like the smaller, interesting off the grid option. Um, and sometimes that leads to delight, sometimes that leads to you know, despair, but it's worth, <laughs> worth trying, right. yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've seen consistent, consistency slip um, in recent years with, with the chains. So I, I, I really try to find uh, boutique hotels, um, especially if I'm there for work. I, I usually you know, want to know the general area I want to stay in, and then I'll see um, what boutique hotels are available. I mean, I'll you know, default to SPG if I, if I have to, but um, uh, yeah, I, it's just I can't count on a Ritz being the same, you know, um, or Hyatt being the same around the world. So it's it's not, right. you know, worth having this impersonal experience when I can have a more personal experience. Right. Alex, final thought. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm pretty much the same on uh, boutique hotels, but I think one name that doesn't probably come up as often um, is actually Soho House. Um, so I try to stay in any Soho House uh, like hotel property they have in any city. 
because there's a certain element of like getting the little things right that they've nailed down to making sure the Wi-Fi is the exact same in every hotel so I don't have to ask for the code at each time. Um, there's a flat iron in the bathroom so I don't have to pack one. The, um, the types of products that they, they provide are ones that um, fit my lifestyle. So I think right. uh, that chain is kind of like the unsung hero of boutique hotels. Right. All right, so just, uh, just kind of summarizing some key themes. Um, uh, consistency and execution, um, true loyalty. Um, what else, guys? I think a lot of people, what I'm seeing is like people that would, in a previous generations, be like hyper-loyalists are kind of turning into free agents mm -hmm. in terms of not always staying with the same thing or flying with the same airline, especially as like things are being eviscerated or the standard isn't the same as you were saying. You're, you're starting to see people that should be kind of like locked in to a brand just being like, eh, I'm just gonna go with the flow a little bit more. And one last note, I mean, just offer some vegetarian meals. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just flew back yesterday uh, from Amsterdam no, in, in business. No, no vegetarian option oh. available. And like, that's just ridiculous in this day and age. <laughs> Leonard's kind of like. Mm. I, listen, I, I read, I, I thought the, the manifesto that Rafat and, and you guys did was amazing. I, I read it and also realized I'm a horrible human being in reading it because I'm <laughs> the polar opposite of everything on there. I think it makes total sense. For me, it's, it's not, and it goes back to personalization. Like, I actually don't want to talk to people when I travel. I don't want to talk to people at the front desk. I just, give me my key, don't look at me, and let me go to my room <laughs> and, and be alone where I deserve to be alone. You know, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna do that stuff, so I, I think that's the point, is that everybody's very different, and it's very hard to, uh, to get those perspectives, but in this day and age, it's really easy. And you should be very, you should be able, as, at a front desk in a hotel or an onboarding experience in an airline, to be really clear, not just a preference checklist where somebody has to say, I really don't like people and I don't want to talk to them. Like, you, you, you should be specific <laughs> enough. I wish I was kidding, but anyway. <laughs> be specific, specific enough to know this person has just arrived from Amsterdam and be able to greet them in a way to know they're probably tired, they're probably jet lagged. Like, that info is basic. You should know that stuff. And all of the preferences around work preferences and where they like to sit, all those things are great. And the way hotels deal with it now is they'll put you on a VIP list, which is, which is a very old school, I don't know if you know these VIP lists, but there's now different grades on VIP lists. So, and basically at the nine o'clock staff meeting, your picture is shown around and they have to recognize you by name. And that's about it. It's like, listen, nobody, I mean, some people care, I guess, but like, it's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be more than that. And it's inexcusable in a date where you have a very sophisticated, easy systems or just creeping on Facebook where you should be able to know these things very early on. Right. Really. I feel, I feel like the standard is just so much higher and people are not comparing their experiences among different travel and hospitality brands. You're comparing it to all other like platforms. So the fact that Spotify knows what type of music I like in this playlist every right. week my hotel should be able to know right. what my preferences are. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, you heard it from uh, the, the horse's mouth. Listen to these people uh, next time. Uh, so Hopefully thanks. it didn't sound too bitter. I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, we didn't get to yeah. the positive. I'm sure they have plenty yeah. of good things to say, too. Um, but uh, round of applause. <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs>